Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I was saying I have a few copies of my book. If anyone wants to buy one, they can see me. Now, I usually t talk about specific topics in uh, alternative medicine or science-based medicine. I, I, I try to provide information. But I'm going to do something a little bit different today and just have some fun with alternative medicine. Um, you may have noticed that there are claims in alternative medicine that are really funny. Now, I mean, laughing out loud, rolling on the floor are funny, especially the ones that are completely out of touch with reality. And when something's funny, it's okay to laugh. Now, the humor in alternative medicine is one of the things that attracted me to it in the first place and made me want to learn more about it. And um, it, made, it made me laugh, and I could see that it was going to be an inexhaustible source of entertainment. Um, to show you what I mean, I want to tell you about one of my first experiences with the wild and wacky world of alternative medicine. My adventure started at the mailbox. I got an advertising brochure in the mail for a dietary supplement that was supposed to do the most wonderful things. Uh, it would give you more energy, it would help you sleep better, and it would prevent and cure a whole array of illnesses, everything from headaches to cancer. Imagine that, it would prevent and cure cancer. Now, you're probably wondering, uh, why don't I know about this, and where can I buy some? But no, I take that back. This is a skeptical audience. You're not going to rush out and buy it. You're going to ask, uh, how could that be true, and where is the evidence? Uh, and you're probably wondering what the name of this miracle remedy is. So I'm going to tell you. Are you ready? Wait for it. Ta-da! <laughs> vitamin O. Now, I, I, when I read that, I was already laughing because everybody knows the vitamins only made it as far down the alphabet as vitamin K. And um, as I kept reading, I learned that the O stood for oxygen. And if you know what a vitamin is, you know oxygen is not a vitamin. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, as I kept reading, I found that vitamin O was an oxygen supplement that consisted of oxygen gas in liquid, in water. And um, now, fish can get their oxygen from the water that they swim in, but fish have gills. Humans don't have gills, and the human digestive tract is not equipped to extract oxygen from the liquids that we ingest. So, um, as I kept reading, it got sillier and sillier. Um, it turns out that it comes in a little bottle with an eyedropper, and you're supposed to put four or five drops of this stuff on your food or in your beverage, and it's supposed to raise the oxygen level in your blood. Now, consider the size of a drop. Even if those drops were 100% oxygen, and even if 100% of that oxygen could somehow get into your bloodstream, it would be such a tiny amount compared to what you inhale with every breath that you, it would be hard to imagine that it could make any difference at all. And of course, there's no reason to think that oxygen, or that increasing oxygen levels in your blood could have all of those wonderful health effects that they were uh, bragging about. And uh, then, I found something that really blew my mind. Uh, in their advertising, they said that they had had vitamin O tested in an independent laboratory, and the laboratory found that it contained no oxygen. Now, think about that. They're selling an oxygen supplement, and they're telling you there's no oxygen in it. Uh, but they thought that they could admit that because they thought they could explain it away. You see, there is so much oxygen in vitamin O that the laboratory was unable to measure it. <laughs> so you see, the laboratory equipment could only measure up to 40 parts per million. Well, it seems to me if it could measure up to 40 parts per million, that it would measure up to 40 parts per million and register as that, not register as zero. So I got to wondering, what universe do these people live in? Now, in my universe, if you take a pitcher of water and try to measure it by pouring it into a glass, you end up with a glass that's full to the brim of water and overflowing. 
Apparently in their universe, you can pour the whole pitcher of water into a glass and the glass stays empty and dry. <laughs> but they thought that they could prove that there was oxygen in it by doing a clinical study. Um, they decided that they could give vitamin O to patients and show that their blood level of oxygen rose and that would prove that there was really oxygen in vitamin O. Well, no, it wouldn't really. That's circumstantial evidence. And it would be indirect evidence that oxygen was present, but indirect evidence of presence doesn't outweigh direct evidence of absence. So it didn't make sense, but they thought it did. And they went looking for a scientist to do a clinical study. Now, if they approached any legitimate scientist who understood about oxygen and physiology, they, he probably would have just laughed at them. But they found a medical anthropologist who thought he could do the study. And um, he decided that he would study anemic patients because he figured, well, anemic patients have low oxygen levels, so it will be easy to show that the oxygen levels rise when we give them vitamin O. Um, now, he did, he did one thing right. He decided to use this test, the PaO2, that's the pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, which is the gold standard test for the oxygen levels in blood. He did that one thing right. That's the only thing he did right. Um, the PaO2 didn't mean what he thought it meant. Um, it's a, a measure of how much oxygen gas diffuses across the membranes from the air sacs and the lungs into the blood. And uh, he thought anemic patients had low PaO2s. But there's only two reasons for having a low PaO2 level. One is less oxygen in the air. If you go up to the top of Mount Everest, your PaO2 level will be low. The other reason is some kind of a problem in the lung that impairs the diffusion of the gas across the membranes. Now, anemic patients don't have low PaO2 levels. They have low hemoglobin levels. Now, hemoglobin is the big molecule that gloms onto the little oxygen molecule in the lungs and carries it through the bloodstream and then releases it to the tissues. And uh, their hemoglobin level is low, but their PaO2 level is not low. So if, uh, if he measured PaO2 levels in these anemic patients, you would expect the before and after measurements to be both normal and to be exactly the same. And then, in a bizarre twist, he decided to do his study in a community of Hutterites. Now, Hutterites are members of an Anabaptist sect who live communally in groups of between 60 to 150 people on collective farms, mainly in the, in the western United States and Canada. And they remain aloof from outside society. They're kind of like the Amish. Why, do, why Hutterites? Well, he figured if he did the study in Hutterites, he wouldn't have to use a protocol and he wouldn't have to get informed consent. He could just order the, ask the minister in each community to order all of the people to participate in the study. Well, that's highly unethical because when you do research on human subjects, you have to get approval from an ethics review board to make sure that the patient's rights are uh, protected, that they're not being put in any danger, and that they have the ability to give informed consent and understand what's going to happen to them in the experiment. So this is entirely unethical and arterial blood tests are risky. It's not like a regular blood test where you draw blood from a vein that you can see. It requires drawing blood from an artery and they usually do it in the wrist, you know, where you feel your pulse. I learned to do this in medical school and it, there's quite an art to it. It's very tricky. You have to feel the pulse with one finger feel the pulse with another finger, and then imagine where the artery is in between. The artery is, is buried, it's deep, it's small, it's rubbery, the needle can bounce off the, uh, the artery or it can nick it and there can be bleeding into the tissues. And you can get a, a hematoma and a blood clot as a consequence of this. It doesn't happen very often, but if it does, it can be devastating because if you don't have collateral circulation on the other side of your wrist, it can cut off the blood supply to your hand, which is not a good thing. So it seems to me that uh, patients enrolling in this study at least ought to know that there's some risk to doing this test and ought to be able to decide 
whether they want to participate instead of being told by their minister. Um, and there's another problem. The incidence of anemia in the general population is between 1 and 2 percent. So in Hutterite communities with 60 to 150 people, you would expect to find only one or two people in each community who were anemic. So he would have had to go to a whole lot of communities to do his study. But um, he, he didn't. Uh, he found plenty of anemic subjects in just a few communities. And he thought that they would have a low PaO2 level, and by golly, all of the anemic patients he tested had a low PaO2 level. Now, if I had found that, I would have been worried. I would have thought, gee, these anemic people must have some kind of a lung disease. Uh, uh, there, there must be something causing anemia. Maybe they have a genetic disorder, or maybe there is some uh, environmental toxin that they're being exposed to that makes more people in the community have, um, have anemia. And um, then he found that they all had low PaO2 levels, which they're not supposed to have. Now, if I had found people with a whole community full of people with low PaO2 levels, I, I would ask, you know, what's causing this? Some, something's wrong here. But he didn't notice anything was wrong. And by golly, the levels rose after they took vitamin O, just as he would have predicted. Isn't that interesting? You know, there were a lot of other things wrong with this study. Uh, it, 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 the results he got were simply physiologically impossible. He could not possibly have gotten the results that he did. And I'm convinced that he never did any such study. I think he just fabricated the data. He sat, sat in his office and made up the numbers. And uh, it, it was just uh, totally bogus. Uh, it, it just could not have happened the way he said it happened. And. Um, It, it, it was the worst example of junk science that I had ever seen, and I complained about it to Wally Sampson, who was the editor-in-chief of the, the uh, Scientific Review of Alternative Medicine. And he said, you know, there's a lot of junk science like that out there, and nobody takes it seriously enough to pin down what's wrong with it. So he said, why don't you do a formal analysis of the study, and we'll publish it in the journal. So I did, but I hated doing it. Because uh, when you have a problem, yeah. <laughs> so when you write for a medical journal, you have to be all serious and formal, and you have to use a certain kind of language. There's no, no snarkiness allowed at all. And I, I chafed at the restrictions, because I thought this whole vitamin O thing was hilarious, and I wanted to make fun of it. So I wrote a funny version of it for the Skeptical Inquirer uh, entitled, Oxygen is Good Even When It's Not There. <laughs> and the article was a great success, and it launched my career as a skeptical writer. Now, vitamin O is still for sale, and uh, it even has its own Wikipedia page, which cites my article. And in, uh, in 2000, the company had to pay a $375,000 fine to settle FTC charges that they made false and unsubstantiated health, health claims in their advertising for vitamin O. Now, here's a statement that I copied from the company's website. I want to read it to you because it's one of the most delicious examples of pseudoscientific nonsense you're ever likely to hear. The whole process involving the creation and stabilization of O2 from normal oxygen, or O1, involves a series of electrical bursts through special metal rods submerged in saline solution over a brief period of time. The electrical force used to rearrange oxygen atoms and knock off sodium in most hydrogen atoms is subjected to an unusual agitation before it ever reaches the saline solution for which it's intended. This agitation introduced into the electrical phase of the process helps to guarantee greater stabilization of the liquid oxygen components by coupling one of them with a single hydrogen atom. Now, the final supercharged oxygen that comes out at the end of these several very different kinds of agitation has lots of O2, some O3, and even a little bit of O4. 
Each of these is incrementally 30 times stronger, meaning that O2, if O2 is 30 times stronger than O1, then O3 will be 30 times more stronger than O2, and so forth. <laughs> now, if any of that makes sense to you, you should be very worried. <laughs> and I found this lie on their website. Uh, it says, the FDA will not allow the results of our studies to be published, as they feel that the studies were not conducted in a way that meets their standard. Well, that's ridiculous. The FDA doesn't have any control of any kind over what studies get published. It's just silly. Now, so I had fun ridiculing vitamin O, but people would criticize me for ridiculing it. And in every issue of Michael Shermer's Skeptic magazine, he prints this quotation from Spinoza. I have made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. Well, I think I understand the actions of these people quite well, thank you. Uh, they didn't care about the truth. They were only trying to sell their product. And I think their actions should be scorned and bewailed. I think they were dishonest sleazebags who were fair game for as much ridicule as I could throw at them. Now, I ridiculed the sleazebags, but I didn't ridicule their customers because they believed the claims because they didn't know any better. And I have made a ceaseless effort to understand why people believe weird things. Why they accept homeopathy and reject vaccination, for instance. And I've studied human psychology, and I, I think I understand a lot about what's going on. Books and articles like these have been very helpful. Michael Shermer's book on why people believe weird things, James Alcock's article on the belief engine, and Barry Beierstein's classic article on why bogus therapies seem to work. Now, evolution prepared our minds to keep us alive in a pre-scientific world. But in our modern world, our natural ways of thinking have become a handicap. We're far more impressed by stories than by studies. We see patterns that aren't real, like the uh, Virgin Mary on a grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, we jump to conclusions before we have all the data. And we're influenced by emotions. And critical thinking and, and science don't come naturally. They require a lot of education and practice, and not everyone can do it. And I've, I've long wondered, why do some people become skeptics and others don't? What's, what's the difference? Uh, well, take two people who think that dowsing works and explain to them the ideomotor illusion and what, what makes the forked sticks bend, that they're doing it without realizing it and show them all the studies that have been done showing that dowsing doesn't work. And one person will say, oh, I guess it doesn't work. I was wrong. Thanks. The other person will say, whatever. I know it works because I've seen it work. So why do some of us become skeptics? Well, I asked Ray Hyman that question <laughs> once. And Ray says that skeptics are mutants. He thinks that something has evolved in our brains that makes it easier for us to learn critical thinking skills and overcome the natural tendencies of our brain. And I think Ray is right. And in evidence, here's a picture of my three-legged daughter. <laughs> OK, so when we hear a ridiculous claim, we're tempted to say, how could anybody believe that ridiculous stuff? And we're tempted to call them crazy or stupid. But they're not crazy, they're not stupid, they're just doing what comes naturally. And we should be kind to the handicapped. And people who believe <laughs> weird stuff are handicapped by their lack of knowledge of science and their lack of uh, education and critical thinking skills. So it wouldn't be a fair, fair to attack the, the person, but that doesn't mean we can't attack the ridiculous claim itself. And if a claim is ridiculous, why shouldn't we laugh? Uh, if it's funny, it, it's a natural human reaction to laugh, uh, just like uh, believing in weird things is a natural way for people to think. Um, and if we don't confront ridiculous beliefs because we don't want to hurt the feelings of believers, I think that's condescending and disrespectful. It implies that there are delicate flowers that need to be protected from having their ideas challenged. Now, 
if I, if I believe in some ridiculous claim, I hope someone will tell me it's ridiculous, and I hope I'll be able to accept it and change my mind. But unfortunately, some people's identity is so bound up with their beliefs that they take any uh, criticism of their beliefs as a personal attack on their worth as a person. Well, I see that as their problem, not mine. And sometimes ridicule might even be a good thing. For someone whose ideas have never been challenged, it might be a wake-up call and a shock. It might get their attention and introduce that first sliver of doubt. And lots of skeptics have used ridicule and humor effectively. For instance, Tim mentioned in Penn and Teller with their bullshit series. So laugh at the claim, not the person. Just remember to be respectful. Now, I went to a presentation by a magnetic mattress pad salesman, and he said, the negative magnetism is greater at night because the moon is out. Now, is there any possible reaction to that other than to laugh? I mean, really. Um, it, it's so out of touch with reality that it isn't even wrong. I mean, <laughs> and the guy obviously doesn't know enough about science that you could even try to explain things to him. So now I've explained my rationale for laughing, and I'm going to share some more things in alternative medicine that have made me laugh. But before I do, I want to ask you to do more than just laugh. I want you to celebrate the creativity. You know, when I encounter a particularly silly claim, I keep wanting to say, you couldn't make that stuff up, but somebody obviously did make that stuff up. And uh, you have to appreciate the inexhaustible ingenuity, imagination, and inventiveness of the human mind. And the same qualities that led to these crazy alternative medicine claims are the same qualities that we appreciate in stories of science fiction and fantasy and literature and the movies, uh, the same things that lead to artistic accomplishment and some of the same ideas that have led to scientific discoveries. Um, and in some cases, the alternative medicine people have built up this whole a um, whole system of interlocking ideas that makes sense internally. It doesn't have any connection to reality, but it, it took a lot, of, uh, a lot of intelligence and creativity to build up those systems. So we can appreciate the creativity without believing that the creation represents reality. And with that in mind, let's look at some of the things in alternative medicine that have particularly made me laugh. Have you ever heard of railroad therapy? Uh, I don't think it has spread much outside of Indonesia yet. That's where it originated. There was a man in Indonesia who'd been paralyzed by a stroke, and he was disabled, and he became despondent, and he wanted to commit suicide. So he lay down on the railroad tracks, hoping to be run over by a train. And as he lay there, he started to feel better, and he suddenly realized that he was cured, and he got up and went home. And patients go to the railroad tracks, and they lie down with their head on one rail and their legs on the other, and uh, they, um, if a train comes, they jump off quickly. <laughs> and uh, some, some of them think that it's the electricity from electric trains that's carrying them. But the rails don't carry any electricity. The electricity is carried in those overhead wires. So that doesn't make sense. But uh, these people really believe in it. Uh, they think it works for high blood pressure, diabetes, strokes, insomnia, high cholesterol, and a variety of other medical conditions. And it's seen as a last resort for those with other, no other medical options. One patient claimed it provided more relief of her symptoms than any doctor had during 13 years of treatment. I guess the one good thing about it is at least it gets patients out of the house. <laughs> you can buy one of these. Um, this is a 12-sided Vogel crystal in an attractive wooden handle. It provides all the beneficial effects of a crystal bed. It can transmit the seven colors of the chakras. It can be used with chakras, meridians, and reflex points. It creates harmony between the body and soul. It, op it opens energy channels through which we can fill up with positive energy. And you know, crystals are precise sensors. They fill up with whatever is emitted, and a positive state of mind change charges it with positive energy that's then transmitted back to the body, multiplied. Uh, only 890 euros. And Tong Ren is, is alleged to heal all sorts of conditions, including cancer, injuries, heart problems, depression, hormone balance, and grief. And it helps with weight loss by removing blockages in the physical and energy body. 
I think of it as a cross between acupuncture and voodoo. And if you want to marvel at the extent of human gullibility, uh, you can find Tongren videos online. There is a whole room of presumably intelligent adults standing around holding these little acupuncture dolls and tapping them on specific points with magnetic hammers, all tapping in unison. It's really amazing. Uh, they say some patients are healed in a single session, some require multiple sessions, some get only partial relief, and some people seem not to respond, maybe because they're too busy laughing. <laughs> uh, here's another one, a Corin specific technique. The videos of this technique are almost as funny as Tong Ren. The chiropractor makes rapid hand movements around the patient's head to sense where the problems are. And then he uses an arthrostem instru instrument that goes brrr, 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 at specific points on their body. And uh, they alternate the, the sensing and the brrr, brrr. And There's one video that shows couples therapy. There's a married couple facing each other and there's a chiropractor behind each person's back doing this to each of them. It's supposed to do all kinds of wonderful things. It's a healing protocol that's used to locate and correct and release areas of blockage, distortion, interference, stagnation, subluxation, and other stresses in the body and mind. And uh, you can learn how to do this through a home study course or in a seminar, and you will know exactly where to correct, and you can't overcorrect. I believe that part. Um, this is the instrument they use. Uh, it's a rapid, re rapidly repeating, high-velocity, low-amplitude thrust, 12 pulses per second. You know, they chose that frequency because that's the low beta somatomotor motor rhythm. This instrument costs over $1,000, so the chiropractor needs to use it on a lot of patients to recoup his investment. And then there's applied kinesiology. Uh, a large percentage of American chiropractors use this bogus muscle testing technique. Um, I went to a talk by a chiropractor who was using it to diagnose allergies. He would have the patient hold a sealed vial of allergen in one hand, and he'd test the muscle strength in their other arm. And if they were weaker, if he thought they were weaker when they were holding the vial, that would prove that they were allergic to what was in the vial. Uh, he said that he had one patient that he thought was allergic to something at work. The patient worked for the Boeing company. And he said, you know, I didn't have a vial of Boeing, but I had the patient just think about Boeing, and that worked just as well. <laughs> and in this picture, the chiropractor is diagnosing this little girl by testing the muscle strength in her mother's arm. And then there are the breatharians. This is Prahad Jani. He's 83 years old. He claims to have lived without food for seven decades, surviving on universal life force energy alone. Now, the Indian Army is studying him, trying to figure out how he does it, but they're not providing 24-7 surveillance because, <laughs> gee, this, this nice old man certainly wouldn't lie or try to fool the Indian Army doctors, would he? And there are how-to books about breatharianism, and believers around the world have tried to emulate this guy. Some have died, but most of them have gone back to eating. <laughs> A doctor in France in the 1950s imagined that the ear looked like a fetus curled up in the mother's womb. So he developed this bogus homunculus in the ear that supposedly shows which spots in the ear uh, affect conditions in those particular parts of the body. Now, there are no anatomical connections between the ear and those other areas of the body. And that's just one of many homunculus ideas. There's foot, foot reflexology with another bogus map there's iridology, there's hand acupuncture, and there's, uh, this, that last one was from um, acupuncture, and this, this one is from hand reflexology. You just press on the right spot to relieve pain in the corresponding area of the body. Notice that, the, that the, this is very different from the other hand map. And notice the spine running along the outside edge of the thumb, the eyes on the middle finger, the arms on the index finger, and the heart at the tip of the little finger. Uh, there's even a map for teeth. The top two front teeth are connected to the kidneys, supposedly. No, they're not. Uh, and then there was a butt reflexology hoax. <laughs> this doctor invented this as a joke, and he submitted a paper to an integrative medicine conference, and they invited him to come and speak about it. And he, <laughs> and he had to tell them it was just a joke. Uh, you know, they couldn't tell that it was a joke because some of the other people that were speaking had ideas that were even crazier than that. 
And he published an article about this hoax in the British Medical Journal. And this is Adam Dream Healer. He began manifesting bizarre powers like telekinesis at the age of 15. He said pencils would fly into his hand. Nobody else ever saw that happen. Uh, and he had a dream. The dream told him to go to a specific island off the coast of British Columbia where he would meet a large black bird, and he did. And the bird locked eyes with Adam and imparted to him complex scientific information about the universe. Adam's parents were so impressed that they took this picture of the bird. Now, what do you think? Does this look like a picture of a supernatural quantum mechanics instructor or maybe just a random crow? <laughs> well, with Adam's new bird brain knowledge, <laughs> he discovered that he could visualize and go into a trance and heal people. And by the age of 19, he was making over a million dollars a year healing people. And he healed Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, at a distance of 2,700 miles. Mitchell had a, a, um, an MRI scan that showed a spot on one kidney. And the doctors didn't know what it was, and they wanted to do a biopsy. But he refused the biopsy, and he jumped to the conclusion that he had kidney cancer. And he got Adam to heal him by distance. And sure enough, when he got another MRI, the spot, the spot was gone. Now, which is more likely, that Adam healed cancer from thousands of miles away, or that Mitchell never had cancer in the first place, just some kind of an imaging artifact or some kind of a benign lesion that went away on its own. And then there's therapeutic touch, which is a misnomer because they don't touch the patient, they touch the human energy field that they can sense a few inches off the body. Well, a nine-year-old girl debunked that for a school science fair study, Emily Rosa. Uh, she, she tested the practitioner. She said, if I hold my hand over yours, can you feel my energy field? Oh, yes. Now when I take my hand away, can you feel it? Oh, no. Now can you feel it again? Oh, yes. It worked great as long as they could see her hand. But then she put up a screen. So when they couldn't see her, they weren't, didn't do any better at guessing than chance. So it was kind of like the emperor's new clothes, where it took a child to show that the adults were deceiving themselves. And then there's ear candles. Whoever thought up this, like, who was the first person to stick a candle in their ear and light it? And what were they thinking? <laughs> uh, the candle's hollow, and it's supposed to create a vacuum and suck the wax out of your ears. But it's been tested. It does not create a vacuum, and it does not suck out wax. But they'll open up the candle, and they say, look, look, at this is all the wax that came out of your ear. Well, skeptics did the, a very simple test. They just lit the candle and didn't put it into an ear. And they got the same debris. It's from the, the candle wax. It's, it's not anything from the ear. And you may have seen these detox foot baths. They tell you that the toxins are coming out of your feet, your feet through the skin and changing the color of the water. But uh, if you run the machine and don't put your feet in the, in the bath, you get the same color change. It's just rust from the electrodes. <laughs> and then there's ancestor bands. You've seen power balance bands, but these are even sillier. Um, they have embedded frequencies that will connect you to your ancestors in the afterlife so they can advise you and heal you. And these are Perkins tractors. Uh, they were little metal rods that were supposed to uh, relieve pain if you, if you stroked the body. And somebody finally thought of making a, a, a placebo version of them out of wood, and they worked just as well. George Washington bought a set of these. And would you like to guess what this is? It's a huge jar that you sit in and add water and Chinese herbs and connect it to electricity. It sells for $24,600 on Amazon. It is a sweat evaporating sauna, healthy urn, nano ion, negative ion, far infrared, hyperthermia, fumigate, pulse magnetic field, purple clay, underglaze, pastel, and yellow glaze, lotus out of clear water. <laughs> and uh, if, if you read the product, information on Amazon, it's hilarious. It's some of the craziest gibberish because they mistrans mistranslated things. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip a couple of things. There's urine therapy. The Prime Minister of India used it, and uh, Sarah Miles, the actress, swears by drinking her own urine. There's a no-touch chiropractor. There's a chiropractor who uh, puts her hands like this and goes, <clears throat> and crack makes a cracking sound in her own wrists about that far from the patient. And uh, they filmed her, and they had her watch the video and said, look, you're not touching the patient. And she said, my whole thing is that I'm touching. 
And I saved my favorite for last. This, this is Brazzo the Gazer. Uh, he stands on a podium and he silently stares at the audience for five or ten minutes. He doesn't make any claims for what he does, but his followers uh, claim that they see energy or a golden aura, and they experience peace or relief from pain, and they've been cured for all kinds of diseases. This guy is making millions just standing there doing nothing. Wouldn't you like to have a job like that? Uh, his supporters claim that just looking at his picture is sufficient for healing, so behold and be healed. Now, uh, finally, I'd like you to look at the claims and elaborate belief systems of alternative medicine as fiction and as a manifestation of the inexhaustible creativity and inventiveness of the human mind. Um, one of the commenters on the science-based medicine blog said, people have two great skills, to make something up and to believe it's true. And it takes a lot of work to overcome these skills. And whether or not the believers can overcome them, we skeptics can use our own skills to appreciate the ingenuity while rejecting the beliefs. But don't forget that silliness kills. Um, sometimes alternative medicine kills directly, and sometimes it kills indirectly because people reject other medical care. And uh, it's, it's okay to laugh. Sometimes you have to either laugh or cry. And laughing is a lot more pleasant than crying, and crying doesn't change anything. There's even some evidence that laughing might make you live longer. And I'm not sure I believe that, but even if you don't live longer, you'll enjoy it more. So.